Good afternoon to all participants. My name is Vanja. I'm a project director for corporate education at Fundação Dom Cabral. It's a pleasure to be here with you today hosting this webinar. As part of the Fundação Dom Cabral Comunidades event, today's webinar is about trust, technology, and blockchain. There are reasons to believe that blockchain will become more important at the new post-COVID world, but its adoption may as well change several aspects of how business works. To talk about these issues, we are honored to have Professor Hagu Hao and Professor Oliviero, who will share their knowledge with us. Professors, receive my warmest welcome. Dr. Hao is the Sir Evelyn, the Hotshield Professor of Finance at the Cambridge Judge Business School at the Cambridge University, which is one of the business school partners FDC has around the world. He has taught in several universities, including UCLA and UC Berkeley in the United States. He has been the principal at Barclays Global Investors in San Francisco and is currently an advisory editor for the Quarterly Journal of Finance and Accounting and the China Financial Review. Among several other positions, he has been the president of the European Finance Association. His research has been published in several peer journals, including the Journal of Finance, Journal of Financial Economics, the Review Financial Studies, among others. Hagu is co-founder and research director of the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance and a member of the Cambridge Corporate Governance Network. But more important than all of this is that Hagu is a very nice person and a very good friend. To be discussing with Professor Hal, we invited Professor Oliviero from Fundação Tom Cabral. Professor Oliviero is a professor of finance and risk management at Fundação Dom Cabral and the University of Florence. He has also worked as a consultant for the IFC, the investment branch of the World Bank. Professor Oliviero has published several articles in top tier journals and has also contributed in books on risk and value management among many other things has, he has done. What is important to know to make our chat work well? If you'd like to make any question or comment, please click on the chat and write messages and questions. We will do our best to accommodate and address all of them. Professor Hal, Professor Oliviero, it's always a great learning experience to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time and generosity. Professor Olivier, I invite you now. Thank you very much, uh, Banja, for the presentation, for introducing uh, us, the, the two of us. And thank you for organizing and, and having us uh, here this afternoon for the uh, first Com Unidade International series uh, version on uh, YouTube uh, seminar. Uh, is a webinar. Sorry, <laughs> we normally we normally <laughs> we have to move to the to the new world. Um, my role, I I will serve as a moderator. So my I want I, my as, as in my role, I will just quickly introduce the topic that is trust technology and blockchain, and I will moderate it during the the immediately after the the presentation of Professor Ragurao, uh, um, the um, the interaction with the with the participants that I welcome into this uh, live uh, uh, streaming um, version uh, of the seminar, um, and. I will start it saying that after a few years in which blockchain remain a, a, a topic for just a few people that, uh, that they knew the technology and they knew the application, meaning that what is normally called blockchain 1.0, 
we are now in a, in a moment in which the the blockchain as a technology is um, uh, raising and is generating many opportunities of application in different fields. And uh, for this, uh, for this um, reason, we decided to invite one of the top scholars in the world uh, speaking on this, on this topic and addressing in, in particular the, the use of blockchain and uh, in um, increasing the trust among people. Uh, I will make it short because I don't want to uh, waste uh, the, the time and, and listening to Professor Raghu uh, Rao. Um, and just uh, and you can keep sending the the question online uh, live. We will uh, filter and present it uh, or during or um, at the end of the presentation of Professor uh, Raghu Rao. The floor is yours. Thank you very much again from FDC and all, uh, all of us um, to accept this kind invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oliviero. Thank you very much, Manja, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to talk, come, come talk to you guys about um, um, what trust technology and blockchain mean, actually, um, in a post-COVID world. Um, most of us did not imagine that we would change our behavior so fast in the last, in less than three months, right? So um, what I've been talking about for the last two or three years has taken on a lot more urgency today. To explain what I mean by this, let me show you a few slides which I prepared. So I'm going to start by asking what is trust all about? Right? So let's start with the question of trust, right? Why do we need trust? So to understand what trust is, <clears throat> first thing I want to do is talk about the difference between what we can do in a court of law versus what we understand and expect other people to do. For example, if you have a contract with somebody else, that contract, if the other person breaks it, you can take them to a court. A judge will tell you whether who is right and award penalties against the person who's wrong. In an implicit contract, you don't know, what, you don't have anything on a piece of paper. You can't go to a judge and say, this, this guy has cheated me, right? You trusted that person and that person has let you down. But all you can do is stop seeing that person again. You can't do business with that person again. Maybe you can, um, you know, badmouth that person to your friends, but at the end, you cannot take that person to a court of law. Trust is all about implicit contracts, and it's where the contracts shift away from things you can write down to things you believe, you expect will happen. Right? So what promotes trust? Well, one thing would be if you repeatedly transact with the same people again and again. So for example, um, if, you, if you are thinking of a transaction with your, um, uh, with your wife, for example, or your husband, um, that you would not write down all the stuff you do in an explicit contract, right? Because there's so many things you do every day. You trust your husband, you trust your wife. So the more transactions you have, the more repeated the amount of interactions you have with somebody, the more is a level of trust. Again, if the big difference again is between explicit written contracts is if something goes wrong, you can sue them. In if you make a mistake with in a, in a contract which is implicit, that means based on trust, you only have social sanctions. You can tell your friends that person is not trustworthy, never deal with that person again, right? So a shopkeeper, for example, who doesn't give you the right items, who gives you the wrong amount of change, who doesn't give you the good stuff, right? So these are people you don't trust and you tell your friends about it, but it's a social sanction. It's not a legal sanction. And of course, you have to have some shared community values between the groups of people. If you don't have the same values, what you say, this is crazy. This person is not trustworthy. The other person say, yeah, well, I think that's totally trustworthy, right? So if you are talking, for example, to somebody from India or somebody from China, they may have very different ideas of what are the right values than someone from America or someone from Britain. Okay, so where does blockchain fit in? To understand that, let's go back to the way industry has evolved over time. Right? 
So industry one was basically our first industrial revolution back in between 1750 to 1840. Then we had the industry number two, the mass production, the assembly line techniques till about 1920. Then we introduced automation, computers and electronics in the 1960s. And today it's all started to become much more complicated, the internet of things, networks and so on. So where does trust fit in? Well, until 1840, until the first industrial revolution, people didn't really talk to anybody outside their villages. I mean, you have, you know, you don't go very far. You born in a village, you grow up in a village, you die in the village. So all the people you meet are all people you've known all your life. So the trust was local. But once business started going bigger and bigger, becoming more and more international, you're dealing with people whom you have never met in your life. So how do you trust them? You don't know meet them. You're never going to meet them again. So examples of the Industrial Revolution, what we need are intermediaries, right? People who sit between you and the other person, an investment bank, a regulator, an industry association, an auditing firm, a credit rating agency. These are examples, of what we call institutional based measures of trust. But what's been happening after that is as more and more technology has started coming in, right? The first IBM mainframe computer in 1964 was gigantic. Right? We had, think about when Apple first came out, right? or the World Wide Web in 1991. This means that you're no longer trusting institutions, you're trusting the system. And that's where we are today. Right? That level of trust is changing rapidly across industries. So take some examples right here. On the left-hand side, you see this is the, this is the Edelman Trust Barometer. So Edelman Trust every year asks people around the world, who, which industry do you really trust? Guess which is the industry that is the least trusted around the world? Financial services. The most trusted is technology, right? Big difference between technology and financial services. And this difference has been persisting for the last 10 years. Do you really trust your financial services industry, and a lot of people will say no. Right? And Rahul, this is could be sorry to interrupt you. This is could be also a consequence of the financial crisis of 08 that for the first time see so many banks go bankrupt and so many uh, hedge fund has a consequence to go with 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 them. That's exactly right. In fact, in the U.S., uh, it's become it's even worse because. The banks created a financial crisis in 2008, but no banker went to jail. Nobody even lost their jobs, right? They just survived, they went in there and they were hired, they got paid bonuses to clean up the mess they created. So there's this lack of accountability. People say, you know, why should I trust those guys? Because all they care about is putting money into their own pockets. Right? So you're absolutely right. And at the same time, right around the financial crisis, remember 2007 was when Facebook really started taking off, right? All the big inventions, the first smartphone was created around 2005, 2004. So you have all big technological innovations taking off right around the time when the financing industry started coming down. So technology took over where finance used to be. So what are the real world consequences? Think of today's world, right? A post COVID world. If you don't handle the system well, this is an older example, but this is what happened in Iran. Right? Same thing is happening in the US today when a lot of people believe that, you know, Trump and basically America has done a terrible job with the COVID crisis. And worse than that is when you look at industries, it shows up even further. So it turns out that in America, a lot of the, uh, when Congress passed the, um, uh, passed the uh, Protection Act, Payroll Protection Act, they asked the banks to give out the money. Who did the bank give their money to? Their best clients. They didn't help the small businesses, they helped their best clients, right? So essentially, this is another way which people say, we don't trust the financial services. We want an alternative. We want something else which will do this job for us. So are there any questions on the, on YouTube or anything like that at the moment? 
now, now, for now, no, but I think you can exp what you were saying, it ju it's just make, it come to my mind the a big debate that is now going on, on the fact that, that all the helps that uh, they have been uh, um, released now from European Central Bank, from the Feds, from central banks worldwide, they mainly go in, in, in a form of quantitative easy, they mainly go to uh, increase the liquidity in banks, but not necessarily the liquidity of the the small businesses that they need in order to avoid bankruptcy. Do you want to comment on this? That's exactly right. The, so the point I'm trying to make over here is, if you if you say, look, ideally you want to go back to world in 1740, right? 1740 world. I know everybody, and uh, I live in the same village as you, so I know whether you're trustworthy or not. You want to go back to that world, but you can't, right? I mean, how many of us even know our neighbors? In a big city, we don't even know who's living two apartments away from us. So how do you trust somebody in a world where you don't know anybody, but yet you can't depend on a bank or a lawyer or somebody professional to be an intermediary between the two? That's where blockchain comes in. Okay, so what is it that's replacing trust today? To go back to before the internet, if you were dealing with a bank, what would happen is you would do something and would go through your communication network to the bank's communication network and a bank would then transfer the money to something or the other. So you're sending pounds to Europe. This is how you'd have to go all through your banks, to the European bank, and then up to the final customer. With the internet, you had the processing system was much easier. So you just go straight down to the internet, send it over the internet, like Swift, for example, is a classic example here. But today, what you want to think about is you, whatever action you take is put into a shared blockchain so that neither of you, you get that information updated instantly and both sides see the same version of truth, right? That is what you see is I know that's what you're seeing and I know you are seeing exactly the same thing. I don't need to trust you because that one piece of truth is there for both of us and neither of us can change that. That's the beauty of blockchain. Okay, so in a sense, what is a blockchain, right? I mean, this, I'm telling you that it's sort of a substitute for trust, but what is a blockchain? At its core, a blockchain is not really nothing special. It's just a digital ledger, right? And people have been using ledgers for 7,000 years, right? We have ledgers recorded back in Mesopotamia. Um, the, everywhere, right? So you have double entry bookkeeping, bank statements, real estate, transit, everything is in a ledger. The key difference is, so maintaining that record of transaction is, has to be there everywhere. The key difference is so far, somebody trustworthy kept that, your bank, your bank manager, your insurance company, your lawyer, they were the ones who kept those records, right? That means you had to trust them. Blockchain is an evolution of ledger technology. All it is saying is you can track ownership of assets before, during, or after any transaction, but with nobody actually controlling that ledger. And actually people have asked, right? So there's a survey of senior executives. A lot of them say the impact of blockchain will be profound. But 40% of them don't know what a blockchain is, right? So my favorite cartoon is this one over here. So blockchains are trendy, right? We read about this all the time. So for example, there is this newspaper article which talks about um, hedge fund companies switching all their mutual fund trades to a blockchain. There's a company here about energy group and a trader launching a new blockchain platform to supply energy crude oil trading based on blockchains. Um, it's happening increasingly around commodities around the world. So soybeans, Again, they use blockchains over there. So trade finance is a classic example where you can use blockchains. And finally, governments are using a lot of blockchain to, to eliminate paper from their services. Everything comes, goes onto the blockchain, right? For example, and we'll talk about this again, land registries can be used using blockchain technology. So this is happening in a lot of countries across the world. But when you ask people, what is a blockchain? This is what they say. So this guy is saying, so the CEO is saying, where should we focus this year? 
So the guy says, we should look at blockchain. Blockchain will change everything. Everyone is talking about it. The applications are endless. We don't really left behind. The CEO says, what exactly is blockchain? This guy doesn't respond, right? He doesn't know what blockchain is. It's also artificial intelligence. That's the other big word which people talk about, but nobody knows what it really is, right? So this is the problem, that people think about blockchain and say, oh my God, it was amazing, but we don't know what it is. So if you ask people, there's a lot of complicated jargon involved. Right? They talk about this, digital ledger technology, they talk about cryptographically linked long, consensus method, smart contract. It's complicated. So I'm going to avoid all that complication in the stock. Right? What I'm going to say is very, very straightforward. When do you need a blockchain? Three situations. Number one, the users want to be anonymous. Right? I don't want everyone to know whom I'm transacting, like cash, right? If I go to a, uh, a shop and pay with cash, that person doesn't know who I am. I don't know who that, I don't care about that person. They don't care about me, it's anonymous. Second one is unstructured data. I, it could be a bank ledger transaction, but it could also be a complicated contract. And finally, the, nobody should be able to alter the ledger without everybody finding out. To understand that, let's take an example. Right? So essentially a blockchain is just a chain of blocks. That's why you know, it's called a blockchain. But each block is a ledger entry, like a ledger entry in a bank ledger. For example, each ledger entry would have, who's the person who started it? Who's the person to whom the money should go? What's the detail of the transaction? Right? That's the basic ledger entry. So for example, this is a simple one. Mr. Black transferred five Bitcoins from his account to Ms. Green. Mr. Blank starts the transaction. Miss Green is the destination. So the ledger entry looks something like this, right? Mr. Blank, five Bitcoin, Miss Green. Very simple. What are the problems? Well, the first problem is maybe your bank manager, the person who's actually keeping the record, remember, diverts the money to her own account. So instead of showing up and Mr. Black sending the money to Miss Green, it goes to Miss Red instead of Miss Green. The money is diverted. Maybe Mr. Black doesn't have enough money in his own account to start with. I write a check, but I don't have the money. The check bounces. Or maybe I send the money to Ms. Green, and before Ms. Green can cash it and pull the money out of her account, I turn around and spend the same cash to buy a coffee. Or maybe I don't want everybody to know I'm paying Ms. Green. Maybe it's you know, something I don't want anybody to know. Right? So these are all the problems we have to solve. These are complicated problems. So how does the blockchain help? The first thing to remember is no one controls a ledger in a public blockchain. So Ms. Red cannot divert any money to her own account. Second one, nobody can falsify anything on the chain, even though no one is responsible for the ledger to start with. It's kind of cool. And there's no double spending possible. No way for Mr. Black to spend the same money twice and finally, everybody's identity can be kept completely secret. Right? These are big claims, right? So when do you not need a blockchain? That's easy, right? If you don't need to store data, you don't need a blockchain. Blockchain, remember, is a ledger entry. You don't have data, you don't need a blockchain. Second thing, if you're the only person accessing the data, you don't really need your blockchain. I mean, think of your household accounts, right? You can just put your money into a spreadsheet or a piece of paper. You don't need a blockchain for it. If you trust your counterparties, you don't need a blockchain either. Maybe you and your wife are the only people who are doing your family accounts. If you trust your wife, you don't need a blockchain. Right? You just you trust each other. The key for the blockchain is you don't trust each other. That's why you need the blockchain. Um, if you trust your intermediary, if you trust your bank manager, you don't need a blockchain. The bank manager is completely trustworthy. So when do you need one? Well, first possibility, you don't completely trust your counterparts, right? But there are a limited number of them. Here, you have one ledger where only maybe five people can write on the ledger. Maybe you can write on it, maybe I can write it, maybe Wanja can write on it, two people, right? And everyone has a different colored ink. That means if I sign my, if I sign my signature, it's in one color. Oliviero, if you put something in, you'll be a different color. Wanja will have a third color. So we know who's made any changes and the ink cannot be changed once I put that in. That would be a blockchain. Right? Um, if, you, if you have a huge number of counterparties, and there are lots of counterparties, 
You can use a public ledger that anyone is allowed to read, write to, anyone is allowed to read from, but each transaction is verified before it's written. And once written out, it cannot be changed. Okay. So here I do need to put in a little bit of jargon. So I'm giving you a little bit of jargon here. If everyone is allowed to read the entries, it's a public blockchain, otherwise a private blockchain. If everyone is allowed to write entries, you don't need permission to write entries, so it is called a permissionless blockchain. Otherwise, you need permission, so it's called a permission blockchain. So that's a big picture. Right? If anyone can read, public. Can you, can you give some some example, practical example? I know that after we will go into the application, uh, but uh, can you give me something immediately to to our participant to that I remind I remind they have to they can make question through the YouTube and we will we will um, try to, to to present to you. I mean, let's go and see which kind. Which kind of application we can we can have it starting from the, the different type of ledger that you are presenting to us? Excellent question. Right. So the first one, think of the biggest one possible. It's called public permissionless blockchain. I mean, it's open to anybody. Anybody can read. Anybody can write to the ledger, and nobody can alter anything once it's written. So there's no permission required to read or write under the ledger at Bitcoin. Right. Bitcoin is the easiest example of the biggest type of network possible, which literally cannot be hacked. You can have, for example, a ledger, which is a permission blockchain. So a permission blockchain would be an example would be R3. It's a group of banks who have come together and created a standard among them. So only people from the bank are allowed to write entries into the blockchain. You can't. You have to, you have to trust the bank to write entries into the ledger. That would be a, a, a permissioned blockchain. If no one else apart from the banks is allowed to read or write entries, that would be a private permission blockchain. But let's say you need to allow the tax authorities to read or write sometimes, you need them to be able to verify that, that becomes a public permission blockchain. So a permission blockchain, another example of a permission private blockchain would be a central bank issued digital currency. Like we talked about China earlier, but China would be an example of a bank which is trying to issue a digital bank central currency. Obviously, no Chinese would be allowed to read or write entries into the ledger, right? It's only the government which controls that ledger. So that would be an example of a private permission blockchain. Would that mean that there will be a, a virtual version of, of money? That would be a digital version of money, but there are two types of money, right? Bitcoin, yeah. public money, which nobody controls. The central bank digital currency would be a private money, which is only controlled by the central bank. <clears throat> okay, so that actually leads to that. So a public blockchain, you need independent people. You need independent miners. You need lots and lots of miners competing to establish what is the right history. Right? And history cannot be changed once it's written on the blockchain. Let's take an example. Let's say um, you, want to, you wake up in the morning and you realize that the Germans, um, that you read in all the newspapers that the Germans actually won the Second World War. Now, how is that possible? Right? Maybe some aliens from outer space came in and they said, we want to change history. You wake up in the morning, every paper, everywhere, every history book, everything has to change in order for that version of the truth is. You're the only one who knows it, right? You don't know, you're the one who knows the Germans lost. But if you tell everybody, hey, the Germans lost, everybody say, hey, you're crazy. Look, all the history books are saying the opposite thing. That's the amount of data. You, that's the amount of how difficult it would be to reforge history on a public blockchain with millions of people competing to tell you this is the version of history. You need to corrupt each of them. In contrast, if it was, say, your apartment board, right? Your apartment block has a board which talks about who gets allocation to um, the garden at the top. Um, you just need to bribe five people. Right? These are the people on the board, you bribe them all, you get permission to go in and do whatever you want. That's a private blockchain. So a private blockchain is less secure than a public blockchain. You need to trust somebody, but it's also less work because a public blockchain, remember, you have many, many people, you have to bribe all of them, but you need to spread that information to millions of people. That takes a lot of time. So 
Private blockchain is pretty similar to what we already have. It's not really a blockchain. I mean, it's a ledger, it's a shared ledger, but I really wouldn't call it a blockchain. I mean, it's useful, but it's not uh, a public blockchain. But go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, uh, Raghu. I, I got a, a question from the audience that go back to a few slides ago when you were saying um, Fernando Santiago was asking, uh, is the, do you agree that there is another situation in which blockchain is not needed? Uh, when we are talking about and we are managing data that are subject to the uh, JDPR uh, law enforcement and the data cannot be erased or modified, do we need somehow uh, a blockchain? Do you agree with this or not? I hope that Santiago... would need a blockchain there. The thing is, Here's the problem, right? With GDPR, you need parts of the data to be anonymous and part of it not to be anonymous. I'll give you an example. Uh, right now in England, for example, we have this issue with tracing for COVID, right? So the idea is if you want to go out of your house, right? Um, and you meet somebody and then you come back later and you discover you've got COVID, the government has to find out who you talk to, right? And who are those people? and how vulnerable they are. If they are, for example, if they have asthma, if they have diabetes, they're much more vulnerable. You need to trace them immediately and check if they have COVID. So, but at the same time, you just don't want anyone to have the ability to check everyone's records, right? You don't want saying, you don't want somebody t telling, um, oh yeah, you got diabetes, you got all these problems, so your insurance uh, goes up, right? So what you need is some way to hide Parts of your data, but not other parts of the data. Blockchains are perfect for that because, and there is an application right now which has been developed in England where you pull out only the data which is non anonymous in order to trace people, but you can keep part of it completely anonymous. You never touch it, you never need, you need to see it. Right? So that would be a perfect example for where you need a blockchain. Um, how you do that, we don't have probably time to go to that kind of technical, so I'm going to avoid that. Okay, but let me give you some Maybe reason. we will invite you again for, a, for another webinar. <laughs> I'd be happy to. This, actually, that's fascinating. The technology is so amazing that it is really, really worth going a little bit into detail to try to figure out exactly how this is possible, right? Keeping everything anonymous and yet unchangeable. That's beautiful technology. But let me give you an example of how beautiful blockchains can be. One of the big problems with most, for most of us is the area of um, writing a contract, right? Think about writing a contract with your electricity company. How many contracts do you have per year? How many times do you change your electricity company? Olivero, how many times do you change your electricity company? So, sorry, Skin. So if you have you know, a, your electricity bill for your house, how often do you change the company for your electricity company? Never, right? For me, never. <laughs> You're on mute, Olivia. Olivia, you are muted. Sorry, sorry. Very rarely. <laughs> so even in England, even in England, we really we can change our uh, insurance or electricity companies every, every time the price of electricity goes down, and I change it maybe two or three times a year. Right? So every now and then. Uh, I get, I get, a, uh, I have a monitoring service set up saying, oh, this new electricity company is offering electricity cheaper than the one you have now, and I change. But now let's imagine a case when all your light bulbs in the house are connected to the internet, okay? You go to the bathroom at three o'clock in the morning, right? you switch on the light, oh, you do your stuff, and then you leave, right? So five minutes. Okay, now in those five minutes, the moment you switch on the light, the bulb is connected to the internet, so it checks all the local electricity companies to say, who is supplying me the electricity at the cheapest rate right now? And it writes a contract with that electricity company automatically. Supplies electricity for five minutes, and then the contract is over, money is automatically transferred. Basically, what the contract has done is reduce the length of the contract from one year, one year or six months to three minutes, right? That's 
the amazing power of a blockchain. Once you combine it with the internet of things, you can come up with smart contracts which do not depend on how much time it takes to execute. You can have a contract that lasts one second. You have a contract that takes 100 of real, right? So not a problem. So you don't need to hire a lawyer because a lawyer will never write a contract for five minutes, right? It's too expensive. So, but here you don't. The contract is automatically done and that's a process called a smart contract, right? If you a think this, this application has an, a, a very big application in, in the CFO life and make the, the CFO life of every company very, uh, very easy because it optimize the cost saving activities immediately, immediately using the blockchain and reducing costs substantially. Now that is a very big problem to keep and preserve cash in order to survive after the, the COVID. Absolutely. I mean, even think about insurance, right? So when we have cars, we insure it for the whole year. But if it's sitting inside your garage, why do you need insurance? So you can write a smart contract when you drive the car out of the garage, the insurance kicks in. When you drive the car back into the garage, the insurance turns off. So you only buy the car insurance when you're actually physically leaving your house. Otherwise, you turn off the insurance. Right? So it becomes, you can write contracts on demand and turn them off on demand. And nothing, no human being is involved. That's why you can do it so many contracts so fast. And this sounds good. Right? Unfortunately, there are problems, right? So for example, you, you get lots of things, by the way. For example, you can have derivative contracts. I pay a thousand pounds to you if the LIBOR is above 2% on the 10th of January next year. Or no, it's just basically computer code that looks at something and transfers the money automatically if something happens. Right? Now, let's take the case when a smart contract goes wrong. Right? So this was a case called the G Digital Autonomous Organization. It was the largest crowdfunding in history, right? The idea was, it was like a mutual fund, like a venture capital fund, right? So there was a bunch of smart contracts. And the idea was, if I have a, if I have a project, which is like based on the sharing economy, I can apply to the venture capital fund, the DAO, and get Ether, which the people who have put money into the DAO um, have given to you. How do you get that money? They have to vote, right? So anyone who buys a token of the DAO has one voting right to vote on which project gets the money. It was so incredibly, incredibly popular. They raised $150 million in less than 28 days. And that was great, right? Unfortunately, while they were raising the money, um, somebody pointed out that the code wasn't perfect. And they said, we'll fix it, we'll fix it, we'll get to it, right? This was about the 14th of June. They said, okay, the thing is over. We we're not going to fix all the problems with it. In three days, on the 17th of June, somebody used that code to start pulling money out of the DAO. The problem was, it turns out that the mistake was that any DAO shareholder could create a sub funds I call it child DAO, and then move money from the main DAO to the side DAO. They nice way to make money. money. <laughs> they, it wasn't, nobody had thought of it, right? It wasn't the code, but nobody had checked the code so carefully. So somebody noticed that hole in the code and they wrote their own program to pull the money straight out of the code, right? So <laughs> 60 million pound dollars left suddenly. The problem was, it needed 14 days to take the money out of the child DAO into the outside world. So these guys discovered the money was gone and they could see the money in the child DAO, but they couldn't get it back right? because it's gone. It's part of sitting in the child. So the only way they did what they rewrote, they rolled back the blockchain to before the guy took the money out and negated all the transactions after that. So when we said, the blockchain was essentially immutable, cannot be changed. These guys changed it because they all agreed, all the people around the world, majority votes said, we come back and we wipe out all that. Can I interrupt you with one question from the participant? Denise Re Regaida, she's asking, uh, there is an international concern uh, when blockchain is used for trade finance. And in particular, uh, is it possible to rank the blockchain or to include in the, in the blockchain also information about the investment grade of the country in which the transaction is originated? 
You can put in any information into a blockchain. You can put a, a, a transaction. You can put a, a 5,000 page contract. You can put a love letter into a blockchain. So people have done this. So uh, in the early days when blockchains are being written, you can actually look at the Bitcoin blockchain. And what you do is you write a message to, at that time people did it, they, they wrote um, um, you know, a wedding proposal to their wives on the blockchain, blockchain. and put it at an address. So you send the money to that address, the money never goes anywhere because you know, there's no actual address for somebody else there. It's just a message. And the message says, I love Emily, something like that. The problem, of course, is if you get divorced, then you know you can't get rid of that line, right? That line. Is there yeah. The problem is that it doesn't it doesn't include divorce for now, blockchain. You have put a new line in saying ignore that line I put in there. I don't love her anymore. Yeah. So yeah. But you can put anything into a blockchain. It doesn't have to be money. It can be a contract. It can be a letter. You can do whatever you want. Right? It can be music. That's fine too. Pictures. Oh, Professor well. Howe, mm -hmm. in your opinion, what's your guess about the use of blockchain after the, this crisis, after the COVID-19 crisis? Which sector do you think it, it will be more useful or they are going to be using it I more? Think, good question. I think supply chain is really taking off right now because one of the big problems right now is what happens with supply chain, right? I mean, if you're worried about COVID, where is the who is giving, who is supplying stuff to where? Supply chains have been hit really badly with this crisis. So supply chain finance is probably a very good area where you will see a lot of use of blockchain. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I'm coming to the end sort of now. So I'll just give you a few more applications for the government, for example. So one example is voting. <clears throat> We saw, we, we saw uh, yesterday, actually, that Trump was talking about how there's lots of fraud in, uh, in postal voting in Michigan, for example. And he started screaming at the Michigan governor for saying that we could do you know, voting in, uh, by, uh, by post. But think of putting, uh, putting stuff on a blockchain. The idea is you can see that your vote's been registered and yet your vote is completely anonymous. Right? So it, it's, the, it's easy to make sure that every person can write only one unique vote. And you, can, you, can, you can't see what's inside the vote because that part's anonymous over there. Well, it increases efficiency as well, right? I mean, you don't really, right now, a lot of countries are giving you, the IRS is now giving you a debit card. So as your kind of like unemployment benefit, they'll mail a debit card to you as a refund and then you use it. But why bother, right? I mean, you directly put it in the bank account rather than mailing them a debit card. So this way you can e easily move money back and forth using a blockchain over there. Um, we talked about this already, like in Ghana, they're using this for houses, right? There's nothing on paper. If you own a house in Ghana, how do you prove you own the house? If it's on a blockchain, you can transfer the house. You can transfer part of the house. You don't have to transfer the whole house. That's the idea of tokenization. Right? So you can you don't have to do the whole house, maybe you just transfer your bedroom to somebody else. That can be let's not blockchain. give this uh, this advice to Bolsonaro that is want to tokenize the Amazon, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> as an exactly. Italian, I can say this. I'm not a Brazilian. <laughs> I don't know if it's politically correct, but I mean, it's, it's scary. <laughs> well, in principle, you could do that, right? <laughs> and of course, you know, you can audit government documents. So basically confirm that, you know, for example, I filed my returns in America um, and I sent that in March. I don't know if they've got it yet, right? Because they're not opening their mail. I physically had to send mail because I don't live in America. And it's sitting somewhere in their system and they haven't opened their documents yet. I don't know whether they I filed my taxes or not. Right? So, but if I it was on the blockchain, I could immediately figure it out without having to wait for the IRS offices to open. Right? And of course, government grants, everything is, is transparent, right? You know who's getting the money, you know who's giving the money, no money gets lost in the middle. But again, remember, all of it depends on security. So here's an example. In Moscow, it turns out that
that the Moscow Department of Information Technology said, we're going to have blockchain voting for Moscow. Right? And they put it everything on the internet. They said, we want to see if anyone can hack it. This French researcher hacked it in 20 minutes. The court, <laughs> the amount of, you know, the amount of cryptography wasn't strong enough. So that's another important point. If your blockchain is not secure, it will be hacked, right? So you definitely, uh, just because it's a blockchain doesn't mean it's perfectly hack proof. No, the cryptography Bitcoin. should be a, key, a core, core, core uh, problem on it, no? Yes, this is the major problem. We think that just because you put it in a Bitcoin or a blockchain, it's perfectly safe. It isn't, right? It can still be hacked if your cryptography methods aren't strong enough. In this case, the keys, the encryption chains they used were too short. It didn't take the researcher more than 20 minutes to hack through that. If it doesn't okay, so bit chain, yeah. That's Sorry. right. Um, just uh, thinking here with you guys, uh, I, I can see the real importance of my, 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 my view. In my view, I can see the real importance of uh, blockchain in terms of efficiency, trust, um, cost benefit. But we don't see a lot of companies using it. We don't see the government using it. And um, uh, I read, the, I, I remember I read the last month in the Economist uh, magazine that uh, only few companies will arrive in the front if blockchain starts to be useful. I mean, more useful and more used by the companies. Why do you think it's not so much used as it should be? Um, <clears throat> well, the first practical application of blockchain was basically when Satoshi Nakamoto came up with this idea on Halloween day, 2008, right? That's 12 years ago, Wanda. So, you know, 12 years ago, right? It's not enough time for a lot of companies to actually say, oh, the technology, let's implement this right away. So we it'll, be, it'll take time, but I'm seeing, I think this has really strong potential, actually more potential than artificial intelligence right now, right? But um, again, it's too early. 12 years is nothing, right? Can I interrupt you just to add to the question of, of Vanja, a question that was coming from our participant, uh, okay. Walter, um, uh, Walter was asking, which is, which is, do you think is the country that is more advanced in using blockchain right now? Uh, oh, that's a very good question. So why, why is not so, is not use enough and which one is trying to take advantage and is seeing as an opportunity? Well, at the moment, one of the most advanced countries in the world for blockchain is Estonia. Right? So Estonia is a small country. It doesn't really have, you know, very much in the form of assets. It's kind of thing. So it's done everything to do. Everything is an e-government process. You can start an Estonian company living in England or living in Brazil in five minutes. You can get an electronic ID, put it on their blockchain. Everything is transparent. Everything is written. So there, it's a tiny country but they have done their best to put everything as far as possible, as digital as possible. So that's a good country to think of, right? In most countries across the world, the major problem is the established banks and the established um, financial intermediaries, right? Why would they allow a new technology to come in which competes directly with them? So they, in a lot of countries, the banks are establishing their own private blockchains, like R3 is an example of a bunch of banks which are trying to club together to set up their own system, which they will try to compete with in order to get um, you know, a way around, uh, they call it blockchain, but it's only open to their banks. So you have to pay to still pay the banks. And they are lobbying and, not to open, uh, to, do, to do not develop exactly. the, 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 one, the other one, the public one. Exactly right. I mean, they, they don't get anything from the public ones, right? I mean, if you're a bank, you're hurt if everything is public. You want it to be as private as possible. Right? Then you control. The moment you control, you get the money. Right? So that's one of the answers is uh, there's a lot of resistance. It's not obvious that the banks or the financial intermediaries are going to have uh, incentives to give you what you, uh, the, the blockchain systems. Right? And um, the manufacturing companies, for them, it's not that huge a deal right now because Think of supply chain. Yes, I would like to have a blockchain, but you know, my bank tells me I'm more worried about other things right now. 
in the long term, I think these are where it's really going to start showing up. Uh, but it's too short term right now, just 12 years, as I said. But in logistics, is very well developed, no? DHL made a huge investment, UPS. Uh, yes, yes, but those are logistics systems, right? So yes. uh, companies have started doing it themselves, but these are large, again, large dominant companies, so everybody too follows those guys as well. Maersk, a shipping company, has a, has a blockchain in place, and they are trying to persuade everybody else to use their blockchain again, have it a private blockchain. So, but you can think about how it can change the structures of companies, right? So, for example, do you need shares on your company? Why do you need shares, right? You don't need a bank account. Ether is a classic example. They raise money through a public crowd sale. They have a free floating token, Ether. They operate as a Swiss nonprofit corporation, but all the people are living in San Francisco. There's nobody actually living in Switzerland. It's a Swiss company, but um, none of the money is going through anything. I mean, even pays its uh, customers, pays its uh, employees in ether. It doesn't pay them in first francs or in dollars. So it's very difficult, right? So there's there are trusts. There's no owner. The set of instructions on how to divide the money. A smart contract. Or another example: Do you need to know who your employees are? Right? You might think I would like to know who my employees are, but again. Why do you need to, right? It's in some cases, the developers are spread out. You're fully anonymous. Even the team members don't know who the other team members are, right? One of my favorite companies, a company called Mimble Wimble, where all the developers use Harry Potter with characters' names, right? So there'll be four Harry Potters, there'll be a Dumbledore, and there'll be somebody else. But that's, so that's how you refer to each other. You don't know who they are, right? So who's the CEO of this company? You don't know who the people are. So it's really difficult. Maybe it's not seniority. Maybe it's not internal politics anymore. The rule is written by the software, not in the culture, right? So that's another way of thinking, changing the way the firm itself operates. So there asset? will be no corporate governance. There will be blockchain governance. Exactly. Exactly. It will all be um, software driven, right? So what you contribute tells me what you're going to get in the corporation. Uh, entirely possible. How about assets? Well, they still do this, right? For example, Filecoin and Golem are examples of peer to peer networks that say if you want hard disk space, instead of buying a big hard disk, you use a distributed network where you get money for opening up space on your hard disk for anyone in the company across the world to use it. You say, why would anybody want to do that? If you guys have already, have you ever downloaded a movie on a torrent site? You're already doing it, right? So a torrent site uses space on your hard disk to store the movie, which anyone anywhere in the world can get that movie or book or whatever from, right? Golem is for your CPU. So, you know, when I'm talking to you guys on my computer, my CPU isn't working very hard. Why not use that CPU for someone else? Somebody designing an animation film in Los Angeles can pay me to use my CPU when my computer is down, right? So Golem will have way offer a way to put those computers together. I don't need to buy a supercomputer to do animation. I just rent CPU time from computers across the world, right? So overall, what I've been trying to talk about is how we can still trust in a big world where we don't know anybody, but Yet, we still need that trust. We don't depend on the bank to tell us who we trust. We don't depend on the lawyers to tell us who we trust. Can technology change that, right? So even without that trusted intermediary, can we still have trust? And here, we need to be able to say, you can't cheat. Technology will prevent you from cheating. You can't falsify a transaction. And you can remain completely anonymous, right? These are the big advantages which blockchains have, which try to, try to, uh, try to uh, solve the problems of trust without ever knowing who you are working with. Right? So at the end of the day, do you really need a lawyer? Do you really need a bank? Do you really need a credit rating agency to tell you who exactly, you know, this is a proper certificate, right? It's on the blockchain. So that might be the way life goes forward. And, you know, in the post-COVID world, where you can't even talk to each other, if you're doing social distancing, I mean, I can't even see what you look like, right? I'm not going to shake your hand. I, who knows, right? Well, you might have COVID. So I don't want to come within six feet of you. How do I trust you? So I don't need to. If I have a blockchain, I can avoid that problem completely.
let's walk to the conclusion. Oops. Sorry. Uh, okay. Can you see me now? Yeah. Let's go to the conclusion and uh, with a with a question coming uh, from the from the floor. In the post-COVID world, uh, we see that some uh, industry they might profit a lot from this technology in order to advance. So the COVID forced some industry to use to to uh, to, to use much more the uh, technology than um, than before. Uh, which do you think will be the future of blockchain post-COVID? Well, <clears throat> as you see, there are two, three groups of um, there are basically three groups of people, right? Group number one is the government. So the government is trying to make sure that they have access. For example, one of the big problems of public permissionless blockchain like Bitcoin is, I think somebody in the audience did mention that, is because it's so anonymous, people use it for a lot of illegal activity as well, right? Nobody can control what's on a Bitcoin network. So it is being used by uh, drug companies or whatever to do illegal um, transactions. So that's a negative part. But the other question is at the end of the day, um, uh, so the government says, we want a blockchain. We want to give you a blockchain, which is cheaper for us. So uh, like a central bank digital currency, but then we want to control exactly who it is. So suddenly in the middle of the day, if I decide you're not trustworthy, you're not a good citizen, I cut off your money. Right? I mean, you saved a lot of money for 20 years and you're like, now you're the enemy of the state, you have no money. Right? If they can do that at the drop of a hat, um, that's a question. So again, it becomes, so the government is one, one party which is very interested in this. The second one are the financial intermediaries. That's the people who are the ones who are saying, let's try to come up with private blockchain so we control access still and we get the, um, and we get the, still get rents from the users. And the third group are people who cater to you and me. So there be, here again, two people, right? People like you and me who are the consumers. We have some information we want private. So we, want, we don't want our preferences revealed to everybody. But, if it, but at the same time, we want some information to be revealed to everybody. So for example, I want, to be, I want to, people to know that I pay my taxes, but I don't want them to necessarily know what is in my taxes, right? So Trump is having a lot of problems with that. So you're a good taxpayer, but you don't know, you don't want to disclose how much you pay because otherwise they will yeah. interfere how good you are paid in Cambridge. <laughs> 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 so that's the, so there are operations which try to do that. So there's some companies now which are allowing you to take control of your personal life. So you take all your information and put it into a container. So if your insurance company says, I want to know whether this person really exists, they'll take out that part of the information and give it to you without revealing anything else. Right? So it, the insurance company, if it's a health insurance company, shouldn't care about... Uh, whether uh, you know you got high marks in an exam, right? I mean, it doesn't matter for them. Or you shouldn't care about what was your last bonus you got. But if you're looking at a car insurance company, they shouldn't care about your health. They should only care about your driving capacity. So different people should get as access to different parts of information without um, getting access to anything else. So there's some companies now which are trying to get solve that problem. It's a very big problem to solve because now you have to trust somebody with your whole life. And so that's still a problem. So three groups of people, it's difficult to know who's going to succeed. Like what, all about the, what about the health uh, the industry? The health industry might use it much, much more intensively after this because of the, so. yes, of the exactly. fact that the, the health records and the sharing of information among the, the individuals the, and the medical system that might provide. I agree. That, that's one area which is really important. I, I think, think we that. are we are about to finish. Uh, I would like to first of all to thanks Professor Rago Rao for the for being with us uh, this afternoon here in Brazil and uh, a night in Europe. Uh, and also say that if, if to the participants, if they want to leave their uh, email address, uh, we will be pleased to um, to, to okay. send you any follow up of this uh, of this um, presentation. Uh, from my part, I, I, I take uh, um, I normally profit from what my uh, son, that is a young YouTuber, say. Please do not forget. 
to uh, subscribe to the channel, the, the, the FDC uh, um, YouTube uh, channel, and also, if you like the presentation, to give us a like. <laughs> but okay, thank you, thank you, Raghu. I'm, I'm leaving to Vanja to to uh, yeah. to for the for the ending. For, okay. Unfortunately, our time is over, and I would like to once again thank you all for being part of this chat, Professor Hal, Professor Oliviero. Thank you for dedicating your energy and time to make this meeting possible. Um, with all my respect and admiration, I hope to see you soon. Okay, thank you, Ragu, once again. See you. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, you thank you, Ragu. Good to see you, and thanks to the, to the participants. Yes, okay. I agree. Fundação Dom Cabral is always available to talk more about this. Sounds good. All right. Good evening, guys. Thank you.